you all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Amali, and I'm the events director for Books Are Magic, which, if you don't know, is a wonderful little indie bookstore just south of here. We're so excited to be hosting this event tonight, and before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping notes to get out of the way. First off, I want to thank St. Anne's for allowing us to use their beautiful space for this event tonight. If you need to use the restroom at any point, they are through the doors on my right in the far corner of the next room. For all of you out in the audience, we'd love for you to keep your masks on, covering both your nose and mouth throughout the duration of the event. At the end of the talk, we'll be doing an audience Q&A via a line in the center aisle. We'll let you know once it's time to start lining up for that. And lastly, I know many of you picked up a book when you purchased your ticket, but in case you didn't, as I mentioned a minute, a minute ago, we have additional copies of the old place available for purchase tonight at the table where you checked in, and Bobby will be signing and personalizing books following the conversation. So with all that out of the way, it's my privilege to introduce Bobby Finger and Gia Tolentino, who join us tonight to celebrate the launch of Bobby's debut novel, The Old Place. Billington, a small Texas town where everyone knows everyone else's business, and introduces us to Mary Alice and Ellie, two neighbors and friends tied together by grief. What ensues is a story that is incredibly gripping, humorous, heartwarming, and full of tenderness. If you haven't picked it up, please, please do so. It's been one of my favorite books this summer. Bobby Finger is a writer and co-host of the popular celebrity and entertainment podcast, Who Weekly, a Texas native who lives in Brooklyn, New York. And as I mentioned earlier, Gia Tolentino joins Bobby in conversation tonight. Gia is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of the essay collection, Trick Mirror, which we also have available tonight and is also one of my favorite books, so you should buy that one too. All right, that's all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Bobby and Gia. Hi, do you believe in ghosts? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm just thinking about I'm that so earlier. High. Like, <laughs> I guess that's um, I guess that's obvious. I just think it's very funny that that's the first conversation we ever had, and now, and now we're, we're here. Next, which is read from your book, Bobby. Is about right. Okay. Um, here we go. This is from the first chapter. It's the end of the first chapter. Uh, I was waffling between a couple of sections, but I just love this section. It's the first time that the protagonist of the book, Mary Alice, who was a recently retired school teacher, is seen having coffee with her best friend and neighbor, Ellie, who lives next door. Every morning they have coffee and they talk about their lives and their day and coffee. Um, and they gossip about the neighbors and it's become this nice routine in her life. So I'm gonna read the end of this chapter and hopefully it will make you feel like you made the right choice in buying this book. <laughs> um, okay, so here we go. Uh, okay. <laughs> And now, as the only person invited to sit on this porch in at least 20 years, she, Ellie, was the only thing on Mary Alice's mind. You sure you're okay? I said I'm okay. She opened her right eye and pointed it at her friend. Are you? Mary Alice scoffed. I'm not the one who nearly fell into scalding hot coffee and shattered glass. But you are the one who's home on the first day of school for the first time in what, 102, 103 years? 40, Mary Alice interrupted. And yes, I'm okay. Thank you for your concern. She took another sip of coffee. Bull. Fine, I'm miserable. No, I'm furious. You know she's putting in a pool. Who? The muscles in Mary Alice's shoulders went limp. You know who. Josie Kerr, you have to leave that poor woman alone. Haven't you done enough to her already? Her stomach issues are not my fault, Mary Alice said with a sly smile. Ellie's head shook with disapproval, but her smile suggested otherwise. The wind chime took its cue and played a few delicate chords as Ellie Prosset processed this information. So is Miss Squeezy's pool above ground? Mary Alice smiled. In. Ellie snapped back into sternness and raised her hands up, palms rising toward the sun. You know what? I don't want to be involved in your gossip. Not about her, anyhow. If she wants to sink money into a digging a hole in that yard, that's none of your business, and it sure as hell isn't any of mine. That pool's for Josie and Josie's family to swim in, so it should be between Josie and Josie's family to worry about. Josie's family at their bank. Do you know how expensive it is to break through limestone? Is that a question or a statement? Tommy said it's costing her nearly 41000 for the whole damn thing. That's why Samuel and I never put one in. Forty-one? Ellie nearly wretched, then composed herself. I said I don't want to get involved, and more importantly, I don't want to know how you or Tommy Lutz got that number so easily. She can spend her money however she wants. You know Travis probably does well for himself anyway. Smart, handsome, young thing like that. Maybe Faye even chipped in. Travis is doing more than fine, but I still think she comes from it. Comes from what? What do you think? Money. Ha! You don't know anything about that woman. You've spoken to her, what, once? And I wouldn't exactly call those circumstances fair. Fair? She just, this is, I can't believe I'm doing voices right now. <laughs> fair, she stole my classroom. Though I guess rich people don't steal, they just take. She was given your classroom because she's a bright young woman, and she took it because she's a bright young woman with a family to take care of and a brain to use, Ellie said. This wasn't a conspiracy, Mary Alice. You're not going to find peace until you acknowledge that as the truth, because that's what it is, the truth. Mary Alice wanted nothing more than to soak this into her pores, to accept it as the obvious truth that she knew it was, but she couldn't. I don't have to be happy. You're crazy not to be, Ellie said, shaking her head as she looked back at the corn stalks in the distance swaying left and right as if listening and unable to pick a side to agree with. I'm what? You are crazy for not being happy. You don't know what you're talking about, Mary Alice sniffed with a near laugh. Never did. Ellie scooted her chair to face Mary Alice directly. No more phone calls or unscheduled house visits with angry moms and dads, not to mention phone calls with stupid ones. No more conversations with Will and Gina and Lori and all those other fools who used to spend all your time arguing with in the teacher's lounge. No more filling in for a sick bus driver because you were dumb enough to get certification. She took a breath, then another sip, but she wasn't finished. Something lit up inside her. This was no longer one of Mary Alice's silly complaints. It was an affront to her own life. You think I'd still be working if I could help it? I know you wouldn't. She pointed at an old oil drum in the far corner of Mary Alice's yard to the right of the woodshed. You think I wouldn't throw these scrubs in that burn barrel and light them on fire if someone told me I'd have a pension and benefits until I'm dust in the wind? Mary Alice turned away and pursed her lips. Okay, I get it. Good, she laughed, knowing one push was enough. 
Now, will you enjoy this gift you've been given? Because that's exactly what it is, a gift. Don't you forget that. I will try to enjoy my time as a, she stopped and shuddered, retiree. But I will never refer to it as a gift. You hear me? Not now, not ever. Is that good enough for you? I guess. They both took another sip of coffee, despite neither of them wanting more. What are you getting into today while they're not saving lives? Nothing. Nothing. They sat in silence for a moment until the thought hit Ellie like an arrow. She darted her eyes toward Mary Alice, who immediately felt her gaze. You're planning on going to that school again, aren't you? No, Mary Alice said. I mean, I've considered it, but no. What would you do there? Think about it. What would you actually accomplish besides killing your own time and getting on everyone else's nerves? Isn't killing time enough when you're retired? I'm serious. It's certainly better than killing myself, Mary Alice said, regretting the words even before she could hear them. Ellie turned cold. Don't, she said, the word piercing the air as her mug slammed down on the table. Don't you do that. Mary Alice flinched at her own bad joke, some combination of the sound and the memory rolling inside her, but straightened her back and put the moment behind her. To answer your question, I'd let them all know that I'm still here, she said. I'd let them all know that I will not, know that I refuse to be forgotten. She had had the thought countless times that summer, but she never said it out loud, and it felt different now. As a thought, it was empowering. As a confession to a friend, it felt self-aggrandizing and pathetic, and she cowered in her chair immediately after saying it. No one can forget you, Ellie said. If Ellie was a church mouse, Mary Alice was the cracked bell roaring over her head. How could they? You're too damn loud. Ellie was right, but so was Mary Alice. This was one of the keys to their friendship. They were never wrong together. So many people in this town had a way of bringing Mary Alice down, letting her wallow in her wrongness, but never Ellie. She refused to let commiseration become a hobby. Arguments, she thought, were key to making friendships work, which is why theirs had lasted so long, to varying degrees, since Ellie arrived in town. Ellie had surprised both Billington and herself by moving in. There was no family connection, no husband who dragged her continued screaming from the city. There was only a good job in Trevino and an affordable house 15 miles away in Billington. That she happened to move in next door to another single mother with an 11-year-old boy was pure luck, though she took it as a sign that she made the right choice. Though the halls proudly inserted themselves headfirst into the community, sent attending mass, even though Ellie despised the church, signing Kenny up for all the sports but football so he'd have a shot at making friends and volunteering at the modest senior center in the middle of town, few expected the halls to stay long. Billington wasn't a place you arrived in, it was a place you never left. But against all odds, they sprouted roots, they sprouted roots on Mary Alice's whisper of a county road, and Kenneth and Michael's instant and overwhelming friendship nourished the one between, between their mothers. I'll call you tonight, Ellie said, empty crap in hand. Hope you're not too miserable today. So you'd be fine if I were only a little miserable? Ellie was already in the bushes, but she turned back. Everyone's a little miserable, she said. Bye now. Mary Alice waved, missing her already. With no coffee left, she had nothing to do, do but think. Staring up at the horizon, where the sun was high enough to make her feel like she ought to be busy, she went over the beats of their friendship. Ellie and Kenny moved in. Kenny and Michael became friends. In time, so did she and Ellie. And when they lost the boys one right after the other, of course their friendship changed. Whose wouldn't? An acute understanding of the other's misery prevented either of them from resenting their sudden estrangement, but over time their grief transferred itself from their sons to their friendship. They lost the boys, but why did that mean they had to lose each other? Now, more than ten years after the accident, Mary Alice was glad she had finally decided to try a little harder. And every morning she watched Ellie step up onto the patio, she was certain, absolutely certain, that it wasn't only because she had nothing better to do. The end. Did you do the audiobook? No. He's someone named Barry. Oh, I'm water a little myself. <laughs> um, someone named Barry did it. She's amazing. I, I feel like you could have done it. Could have done the voices. I would have listened to that for seven hours. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, I, this is, I was just saying to Bobby backstage that this is the first book event I've been to in person since the fucking pandemic started. Is this true for anyone else here? And like, we're here for Bobby in this beautiful place for this amazing book. I'm just so happy, I'm so happy for my, for my brilliant friend, a casually incredible debut novelist. Um, I don't, some of you have probably read the book, but for those of y'all who haven't, it is so good. I reread it a day ago and couldn't put it down for the reread. 
The Washington Post said it feels like um, sipping sweet tea on your porch with your friend. They should have said coffee at 7 a.m. Like, like the best friends do. But it is just so good. And I'm just so glad we get to be here. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Okay, so we're going to talk for like, you know, 25 minutes and then we're going to open it up to questions. But so the, the elephant in the room is that you did the thing that everyone said they were gonna do during COVID, which was <laughs> write like an incredible work of art, right? So it's the book started as a screenplay, mm -hmm. and that you had, you had finished it before- Years ago. Years ago. Yeah, yeah. And then a friend told you it should be a novel. Yeah. She read it and just goes, I read your screenplay, and I was like, what do you think? And she goes, it should be a book. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take between her saying that and you being like, yeah, it should be a book? Four to five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like when, when the novel coronavirus reared its ugly head, I was like, I guess she was right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, uh, how did you do it? Um, I, how did I do it? I, I mean, I had this pre-existing thing, and I used that as an outline, and then I just, I just made space in the day as much time as I could make it every day, and I, it was, it was easier than it would have been in another situation because I wasn't seeing people, I wasn't going out, I wasn't doing anything, so like, when I had free time, I truly had free time. Like, it was, it was free time to do as I pleased, but like, within the confines of my house, so it was like, hang out with the cats, hang out with my husband, play a video game, watch a movie, cook something, or Work right. on something. Right. 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 Work on something like yeah. at my desk. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In the bedroom. <laughs> when you, um, I, I, I actually don't know the answer to this. How, how much fiction have you written before? I, the only fiction that I've, I mean, I've written some like. This answer's gonna be infuriating. <laughs> I've written some like, <laughs> I've written some like bits of like bad short stories, but most of my fiction was screenplays. Yeah. And I've written That's like wild. a few of them just because I think they're fun to write. Yeah. And so I wrote. Same. Like, <laughs> Just four or five screenplays that like were just for me and not very good. Um, some were like like truly fan fiction. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it was essentially fan fiction, but screenplay, like it was really Tumblr material. Yeah. Um, but in a different form. I'll turn those into novels too. <laughs> but no, and, and now those. You can do pseudonym, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. But so this is the first time you could try to at this, you know, at this extent. Yeah, because I never thought I could do it. Well, so what was what was it like switching that form? I remember, like, I have I used to write fiction. I've started writing screenplays, and for me, I found it like, you know, fiction. It is so hard because you have to generate an entire world through the texture of somebody's consciousness, which you do so naturally, so seamlessly. And screenplays are almost easier in a way because it's all you generate a world action in. You know, this is all inside out. And I wonder, you know, switching forms. What like what what was natural? What was difficult? And did the structure did the, did the structure change of the story at all, or was was it? The structure didn't change, but like, certain characters became more important. Mm -hmm. Josie became much more important. Um, Josie Mary, is a, is Josie's a, the new girl. She's the one that's building a pool mm -hmm. for 41 k She moved in from New York City, where she was born and raised, and her husband is from Billington, so he had to go home for family reasons. She followed him there, they have a son together, and she's like, I'm gonna have a good time in a small town, even though I'm like, a true city slicker. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, there was a lot more about Mary Alice. Mary Alice's entire backstory like was not something I'd ever considered. And as it existed before, it was all very subtle because there's just not enough time. Yeah. And so I realized how much more I wanted to explore with her. And it just became so much, it just became so much more empathetic, I think, because she's such a kind of prickly, cruel person. And I was like, I just have to figure her out. And that meant like really digging into the backstory and really digging into like her solitude. But the structure was the same. So the way that this book works, right, is like there's, you know, all the the characters are sort of circling this thing that happened in the past, and you and you kind of know what it is, but you don't exactly know what it is, and then the knot sort of tightens at the end, and then kind of und and and it's. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. Um, I, when you were when you were starting the screenplay, like back to the very genesis of the story, do you remember the first like image or the character moment that that really lodged itself in your head and you know made you think like I'm gonna I'm gonna spend 
90 pages, 120, you know. Two, it was two friends. It was that scene. It was two friends sitting on a porch looking out at the, at the specifically cornfield. Yeah. Like, and, and I think that's just like a landscape that's very much like was the a coffee part there? of my past. The coffee is there. Yeah. Um, I think it was probably they were just drinking it, but like it, they have a little table between them with like a little hot plate and they keep, they drink their carafe until they're done and then that's what they do every morning. But like two people on chairs, not necessarily rocking chairs, but like looking out at mm -hmm. their backyard, which is just basically crops and then eventually trees. And, and so uh, you lived, you lived in, in a town that Billington is based on, right? You describe it in the book as a town so small it doesn't have a Wikipedia entry. Um, is that true of the place you grew up? I think the place I grew up has a Wikipedia entry now, now but it it's like one sentence. Yeah, yeah, what one sentence say? It's like, 700 people live here. Well, now it's gonna say that you're <laughs> <Yeah>. from here. <laughs> um, notable people, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's a really small place. And did you spend time on a porch looking at cornfields? Yeah. Yeah. Or <laughs> in the, on the porch looking at cornfields or at the kitchen table overlooking the cornfields on the weird slide in the backyard or like doing whatever I was like on the trampoline, which I didn't really love. It was just there. So, <laughs> and I think at one point my mom was like, we gotta get rid of this thing. So yeah, it just like yeah, disappeared you one with day. the one toy that's in your backyard for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then at one point like the guy with the drug shows up and takes it away and you're just like, I guess it's gone. <laughs> He took it, um, but yeah, that was that was how I pictured it. And we we didn't. There was no one on one side of our house. There was only a neighbor on one on the other side, and they didn't have a kid who was my age, so they like kind of didn't exist to me. Yeah. But their son was my sister's age, so that was one of her best friends. So it was like I didn't have any relationship to them, you know. But so. it was that kind of. Yeah, that, that imaginary like symmetry that, yes. that that worked its way into this. I mean, I don't know if there are any Texans in the house, like me and Bob, but but I mean, so much. I mean, there will be a special layer of pleasure for you in store in this in this novel. It made me, you know, I, I think we both have like somewhat complicated relationships to Texas. Like, are not likely to ever live there as adults again. But it made me really homesick reading your book, and I I never feel you know that homesick. There's you know, about the, the, the plainness and the beauty in that plainness, the, about, about H-E-B, the best grocery store that has ever existed, about, you know, the, the sign, the sign section at Cracker Barrel, you know, um, and just the endless driving and the sort of emotional safety that you get, that every Texan gets in those endless drives. And I wanted to talk, you know, if you could talk about the, the pleasures, I mean, especially during COVID when you're, you know, you're, quite far away from Texas and quite far away from all that like endless space and sky and kind of um, the pleasures and also the complications of writing about home. Um, the main pleasure of writing about home during COVID, and again, I don't think I could have written this outside of COVID or like outside of some situation where I was quarantined <laughs> for a year. You know, like I, I don't think I could have done that, but it helped me feel like I was home. I would get really, that's one of the main reasons I stopped using it. Instagram, that's the main reason I stopped using Instagram when the pandemic started because I was getting extremely jealous of everyone who was with their family. Yeah. I was like, I cannot do this. I, I'm sick of seeing, and if I'm beyond that, it was like, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this, like anytime I saw a single person happy on Instagram, I got so upset. Like, I was like, fuck you. <laughs> I'm saying them in a church, which feels sick. Uh -oh. And I was like, I think God so said mad. fuck you to a lot of people. <laughs> Um, I got so upset, so it was a way for me to like reconnect with home in a way. And my dad had given me this book that like, right before we, the last time I saw my parents before the pandemic was like the first week of March 2020. I happened to see them, I happened to be home. And my dad, like third cousin, who's like a 95 year old man, self-published this history of the town I'm from. And it's like 150 pages, it like the binding fell apart immediately. But it was just like, I had skimmed through it, and so I like actually read it during this process, and it like kind of reinvigorated my I don't know respect for this town because, like I said, like I never want to live in this place again. Right. But like I don't, I'm not ashamed of it the way I used to be, and it, that time let me like understand that, mm -hmm. you know. And so when I was writing it, I was like, okay, I'm kind of home in a way, I'm kind of with my family in a way, 
even though my Mary Alice is not my mom, and these people are not my parents, and they're not my family, like, I kind of felt like I was home. Or like your family is there somewhere. They're somewhere. They're somewhere. Or they were with, they, I felt like I was with them when I was writing it. Yeah. There's no way to talk about this in a way that's not like completely humiliating. But like, it's that not. Is, no, it's not that at is all. How it felt. Yeah. yeah. And it's. I mean, there's also. I don't know. I was. I was. I was reading it like. Well, I was reading it on a plane, and I was just thinking about. Like, there's this. You know, I. I it's not. The, the comps for this book, like I, I think it's gotten some like Lake Wobegon comps. I think it's a million times better than those books. But um, but there's so much pleasure in like this town. It's so small. There's a it's it's like a stage set. There's there's a limited number of options. There is there's a limited number of things. The cast of characters is fixed basically, and there there is so much pleasure in being in. In, in a book that takes place, it's not you know it's not a it's not a snow globe, it's not sealed, but but it is truly a world that that you can enter and feel at home in instantly, and I, you can feel that coming from the book. I'm glad you think that. Okay, I want to ask you to um, so the the passage that you read it alludes to so the, the the two the main character Mary Alice, her neighbor Ellie, they have a long and complicated relationship because they have these two sons of the same age. Um, who both died slash disappeared, um, you know, as teenagers, and and the you know the revelation of what actually happened and why and what spiraled into what, um, you know, kind of spills out slowly. But you know, it's I wanted to. It's, the book is I'm interested in and really moved by the way that you handle the role of discrimination and bigotry in the story. You know, it's a it is a really gentle, kind generous treatment of a, of a central tragedy that is at the heart of the book, right? This, like, two generations of two families that have been torn apart by what doesn't feel, you know, and this is, like, one of those things that feels probably recognizable of, to many people who didn't grow up in places like this. It's, like, not as much hatred as, as much as it is sort of an inadmissibility of, like, difference, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but, like, a, a, a fear that translates into just a, an absolute refusal to recognize. Um, but by the end, you know, I mean, not, it's, there's a sense by the end that this place that seems unchanged and unchangeable, there's this sense that it, it already has changed and, and it will. Yeah. And I wonder, like, tonally, was that, all there from the beginning, or was that something you had to calibrate? It wasn't all there at the beginning, but I wanted it to be there. Yeah. That was, I think, the, it, I think maybe the hardest part about, like, creating this version of the town I grew up in, creating Billington, was acknowledging that it, like you said, it's hateful, but it's this subtle hatred. It's more its more about silence. It's more about like a refusal to change. And acknowledging that it sucks, because I didn't, I didn't want to romanticize this small town at all, because I know that like plenty of people in this town are probably very cruel, have probably have terrible, terrible opinions. And, um, but I wanted to like showcase why a town like this can make people inside it feel very trapped and feel like they have to leave. Um, because Mary Alice feels that way and doesn't act on it, and instead of acting on it, like, sort of just puts herself in this position where she can be miserable for the rest of her life, because it's almost like, first of all, she's doing it because she feels like it's penance, but second of all, she does it because she feels like she tried and failed, you know, like, I I'm trying not to give spoilers in this, in this talk, um, but I was, it was, it was the trickiest thing, I had to, in a sense, it is a fantasy, it's a fantasy world, where it's like, oh, look, you can leave and come back and things are gonna be okay. You can um, finally make the decision to uproot your life that you never wanted to make when you were younger and everything's gonna be okay. And I know that that's not the case, but I wanted the people in this character, in this novel, even, even though in real life I think they wouldn't have all had this outcome, I wanted them all to go through trauma and tragedy and come out happy on the other side. So like, it's, it has a happy ending, and I don't think that's a spoiler, but like, I mean, look at the cover. But the, I, I really, I, I'm being very long-winded, but like that, because it was, the, it was the hardest thing about this. Because I didn't want people to read this, especially people from Texas, especially people from small towns, especially people who are from places that were oppressive, who left them, and are thrilled to have left those places, to see, to look at this and say, no, uh-uh. 
like that would never happen. These people are not worthy of my empathy. They're not worthy of my respect. So like that was constantly top of mind. Yeah, but you know it's a happy ending, but it's not. I, I you know it's it's not. Like, everyone's been through a lot of shit. Yeah, everyone's been through a lot of shit. <laughs> it's not, uh, yeah, like, I think, but I imagine that it was really hard to do. Like, how do you write a happy ending into a place that is deniable to a lot of people? But you did it. Well, another, another like, aspect of that, another way that you break it in that I thought was so smart was that one of my favorite scenes, um, how are we doing on time? We're fine. Oh, no, we're fine. Okay. <laughs> Bobby, I'll look at the book. <laughs> um, one of my favorite scenes in the book takes place in this San Antonio bar called The Country. Yeah. Um, and I think that like one of it's one of the things that I've always found really interesting about Texas, all these other places that you you know the stereotypes out there, whatever. That it's like a lot of there are a lot of communities that people don't associate with places like Texas that like minority populations of any kind, right? Gay people, like refugees, immigrants, anyone, trans people that have not only been there for a really long time but have established like very very strong community hubs in eras where you know, they are not really remembered by people outside the community, right? And Houston is full of places like this, like bars that were safe havens for 15 years and then kind of, you know, real estate rolled them over, but but they meant so much to so many people for so long. And this place, San Antonio Country, is one of them. It's real. It's, it, is it still there? No. Yeah. And I didn't know none of them are still there. Yeah, none of them are still there, but... And lots of them get overwritten by history, but there is yeah. a... But, but, yeah, so at what point did that work its way in? Did you know about it growing up? Like, when did you learn? No, it took I never. Until, uh, until adulthood to learn about any of these places. I never knew. I knew about the gay bars that existed in San Antonio when I lived there. Yeah. I knew about those. I did not know about the ones that were historical that had closed. And I think I also suffered from the same, like, sort of delusion where it was like, oh, these, have only, these only opened in, like, 1995. You know, like, uh, like sort of stupidly refusing to acknowledge history. And when I was looking this up, I, in the middle of writing the manuscript, I knew that I needed this scene with a character in a gay bar in San Antonio in the late 70s, 80s. And I wanted to, I knew they existed. And so I was like, this is a place that I want to be real. So many of the places are, are fictionalized, but I was like, I want this place to be real because I think it's important to know that this place is real and was real. Um, and I found the perfect place and it's called San Antonio Country, the country it existed. It was a very long lasting um, gay bar in downtown San Antonio. And I think that's the other thing that blew my mind. Like it wasn't off the beaten path. It wasn't like take six lurk turns and then like open up, go over like a, what, whatever you call it, like some sort of grate. Um, it is some <laughs> sort of grate. Um, it was there. It was there, it was downtown and it was just right among everything, like a stone store from the Alamo. And, I, and that was such a huge moment for writing the book. Like it sort of, it like, it clarified so much about what she was going through and like how close that was for her. You know, like how close it was for everyone and how completely kind of, I don't know, obscured it's been by history. You know, it's sort of like, we all go through the same stuff. Every generation goes through the same stuff and they think they're the first and they're not. Yeah. So. Okay, just a couple more questions for you. Um, at one point in the book, you write about Mary Alice. Um, it really was her favorite kind of novel, a meandering story about sad people who get a little less sad by the end. <laughs> I, I know you are a very wide and gracious reader. I was just thinking about the things that, the main two things that we've traded recommendations about in our friendship are loaf cakes and novels. <laughs> and I know that you have like wide-ranging taste in both, but that line felt out of biographical, and I wonder if you had any touchstones for that kind of novel, like anything that you were trying to emulate or sort of not do in any way? It's, yes, mm -hmm. it's, and that's like, it's not autobiographical by any means, but like, there I am in, in that page. No, um, sorry, the, that line. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. that line. Um, the, the books that I like reread in the pro, like right before this and in the process I've like just returned to certain things, like things that I underlined were, um, all of Alan Hunlinger's novels, the best. because they, number one, they're like extremely queer, but they go through that sort of, most of them go through that sort of like, slow churn towards a little more happiness, you know, and it sucks along the way, but they learn something, and then also in Tyler novels, which I had read like, due to the recommendation of a friend of mine, was like, I think you like in Tyler novels, and I was like, oh, you think so, and then I read one, and then like, read everything else instantly. 
So I just like, I, I love, that is just my sweet spot, sweet spot for like narrative, like loose narrative structure that I love is exactly that. And they just do that every single time they write something. That's perfect. Okay, are you working on more fiction? I'm working on more fiction. Wow. Well, <laughs> exciting for us. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay, because I am a day one hooligan, <laughs> I have just a couple of questions for you. I water over myself. This is so embarrassing. Okay. I spilled water earlier and it's still wet. Perfect pants for it, too. I know. Um, um, hacky. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> okay, does anyone in this novel know who Rita Ora is? Okay. Who? Let me guess. Well, no, <laughs> I can't say. Oh. But yes, but I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think <laughs> but I think. But I think Josie definitely. Knows. Josie knows. Josie's been you. told about Rita Ora against her will. Yeah. And she's sort of like not. Josie is a friend who listens to Who Weekly, but she hates it. Hundred <laughs> percent. Josie even liked it, and she listened to it and was like, "My friend's an idiot." Yeah, yeah. Like someone, know. someone made her listen to it while they were driving upstate, and she was like. <laughs> Who? <laughs> They're like, that's the point. Exactly. Um, okay, and I just wanted to, before we open it up, I wanted to just play a quick game of Billington, who, them, or not. Okay. Um, okay, so within the world of the okay. book, you need to give it who, them, or not. Well, I'll start I with these. I'm Lindsay, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I almost texted Lindsay being like, okay, but, okay, Sonic. Then. Yeah. No, yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Malibu Barbie, Pages, Hackman. <laughs> not. In okay. Billington, not. Okay, Shipley's. Them. Corn tortillas. Them. Flour tortillas. Them. Big them. Repression. I mean, it's a them, but they say it's a who. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mary Alice. Mary Alice, the, the main character. Them. Big them. Yeah, them, big them. Big what them. about Ellie? Ellie's a who. Ellie's a who. Ellie's a who. Ellie's a who. Ellie's Ellie, a who. What about Ellie's son? I honestly think Ellie's son is a them because yeah. he's soft, he's top of mind, he's crashed, so he's out of the car, so and yeah. he's sad, yeah. Okay, Josie, the newcomer. Ellie's a who. I mean, no, no Josie's a who. Josie's a who, yeah. With them potential? With them potential. I think, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay. No one wants to admit that. Yeah, no one wants to admit that. She has them potential, we have to get her out of here. Yeah. Okay, and this I actually don't know. Jim Adler, the Texas Hammer. <laughs> he's a them. He's a them, okay. <laughs> That's our, like, um, injury attorney. Yeah. I'm um, the Texas Hammer! Yeah, yeah. Jim Adler, Texas Hammer! He has a son who's also... Is the it's son another, a hammer? The hammer he has some sort of, like, other I haven't name. seen that. No, he has a son. Okay, how about Finger Furniture? A popular chain of Texas... No, I'll tell you. That's a move. It's a Houston thing? Because I didn't know about it. Like, it's Houston. It's, it's Houston. Central Texas. Okay. okay. It's a move. Brooklyn. <laughs> I... Uh, no, it's a them. It's a them, okay. It's a them. Okay. Um, selling Sunset. That's a them. They That's a them, okay. Um, Catholicism. That's a them. Um, Protestant. Capital Christian. G. Protestant Christianity. Who? Judaism. Who? <laughs> Seasons. <laughs> it's a them because they know the concept. They yeah, yeah, but, but in actuality, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Marfa. <laughs> Mar Marfa's a them. No, Marfa's a them. Marfa's a big people, love them. Okay. people love one of Marfa, West Texas. Um, podcasts. It's not a not, it's a who. It's a who. It's a who. Okay, Bobby Finger, the host of Who Weekly. <laughs> if they're friends with my parents, it's a them. Okay, but then Bobby Finger, the author of The Old Place. Oh, God. He's a who. He's a them. He's a them. Okay. Again, if they're friends with my parents. <laughs> Okay, everyone give it up for Bobby before we use that. Although, 
if you have questions later, call 619-HUVEN and we can listen to them. We can listen to them later. Um, so, Josh asked me earlier if he needed to be a ringer, and I wish I would have taken him up on that. I'm sure people have them. Do you have another question? Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. The friends that are the, the main and the no. Um, the friends who yes, <laughs> but for the most part, honestly, no, because so many of the people in this, there's one character who is like very much like inspired by one of my old like oldest friends. So that to answer your question, yes, but most of the like the peripheral characters in the in the in the novel that aren't like Josie and Ellie and Mary Alice are weird like nebulous versions of memories of like the old people that I grew up around. Because I didn't and I was telling my parents about this, when they read the book the first time, they read it very quickly, my mom more quickly, and was like, she had to get through it because she was extremely nervous she knew I was writing it. She was extremely nervous that I was going to make it about them. And the first thing she said after it was done, she goes, I'm so glad this isn't about me and your dad. <laughs> and I was like, why would I do that? And it, because it, none of those, and so I like, I don't really remember those people because I was a kid when I lived there and they were my parents' friends and they were our neighbors. And so I didn't really have a big grasp of them, but I remember like the broad strokes of these people. And so it was like fun to remember these people and like fill in the blanks and like try to figure them out, even though I can't possibly figure that out. So I was like, I have to fictionalize these memories that I have. So it's not my friends who those friends are, it's like, it's other people. And also I really didn't want to, I didn't want to lean into any sort of like autobiographical element that wasn't me, you know? So, just to be kind. You're much too kind of a person I to put try in a lot of, to spend I, a whole novel dragging your friends. I put in a lot of names. So like there are names that are there just so like when those people maybe if they read them they're like mm, maybe that's about me and it's like yeah, it is so um, but yeah does that answer your question okay cool thanks thank you for breaking the seal oh, yeah. hello hi oh hi hi <laughs> nice to see you guys um is what you were just talking about why you chose to write about people who are not of your generation and are you going to Um, yes. Yes. I like writing about... <laughs> um, yes. Um, I... The, the reason I like writing about people that are not of my generation is I find it very... Um, I like writing about people my, of my age, but I think it's more interesting, and yeah, I get something out of it when I write about people older than me, because I'm, um... How do I do this without, like, getting too real? I... I like imagining a version of myself that is old. As someone who like is constantly certain they're about to die, like it's like really nice to imagine yourself a little bit older even if you're kind of miserable when you're older. Like and that's, that I like, I like going there. I just think that, and also people who are older have like an entire history that you can create. And I like being able to provide an entire history of a person. Um, but yeah, yes, I will write someone who's my age. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I have a two-part question. Okay. First is, what do you hope people from your hometown take away from this when they read it? And the second is, my friend Jillian said, is this why he always tweets about the Golden Girls? And like, <laughs> are the Golden Girls in this book? The Golden Girls are not in the book, but that's probably, that's probably why, yeah. Um, I also love the best things out of Marvel as hell. I like things about all people. Um, uh, what was the first question? It what was... Oh, that's a really good question. 
And I know that they're starting to read it because my mom texted me enough this morning that like, Daddy got a copy of the mail! And I was like, <laughs> um, I hope that they read it and you said, for, you asked me as Brooklyn who were them. I know that they would say, oh, when people leave, they're like, they, uh, they turn their noses at people who leave. I know that is the truth, where they're like, oh, they're up in New York, oh, they're in Atlanta, oh, they're in Chicago, they left Texas, they're in San Antonio, or whatever. And I know that there's a lot of judgment against people who leave. And I would like them to read it and say, oh, I'm very glad that he's not condescending towards me right now. But that's my, that's my number one hope. And I know that they're going to read it, and a big worry of mine is that they would think that, so I hope they don't think that. Thank you. You're welcome. Wait, I just want to say really quick on that last thing. You were you were saying earlier that you wanted to make sure that you showed the town as a place that could trap people. But I think, you know, like just from what you were just saying in that last question, I reading the book I understood why you would stay. Like from the very like I understand why it would be a place you, you would you would love to stay. Yeah, and I think it's it can be very it can be very nice yeah. if you ignore a lot of the other stuff. And some people are willing to ignore. <laughs> and I think that that's totally fair. So yeah, sorry. No, because I have a secondary part. Um, thank you for this. Um, I am curious that you both are culture writers. Um, you think and talk about pop culture, and I was wondering how do you kind of toggle back and forth between those modes when you go to write fiction? Do you have to like reconcile it? Do you silence it? Like, how do you how do you do both? I silence it. But like, I specifically didn't even want to put in like there's a scene where someone I was gonna read a scene at a grocery store. And I didn't, I was like, I'd rather do this one. There were moments where I considered like peppering in whatever people are reading and like, oh, he, she looks at a people magazine cover at the grocery. Like, these are things that I considered and actively was like, I don't want to put that in here. You know, like, I just want to, I want to separate kind of work from fun, but then the fun became work. So it, it was like, I, I wanted to be in a completely different mode because I was in that mode all the time. And also, again, it was COVID, and I, and I keep going back to that, but like, that's so crucial to like the headspace I was in when I was doing this. I was like, I need to distance myself from everything that is normal about my life, even though it's becoming more and more abnormal, and like, do something entirely different. And that was like, no celebrities. Like, Mary Alice does not know who Rita Ora is. We're not thinking about Rita Ora, you know? Like, she doesn't go on YouTube and watch Trisha Page's videos, like, at all. And, but th that was like, it was, it wasn't hard. I was just like, I just have to stop myself. Because the impulse was definitely there. Because that's what I do. You know, that's like all I do. And so I had to stop myself from going there. What I think you? that's one of the, but again, like this is one of the great pleasures of this book is that it's not auto fiction about like a downwardly mobile, overeducated 35 year old Brooklyn person who's worried about climate change. Like it's like, you know, like I mean, I love all of those books too, but it's like, you know, it's, it's, it is a different world than the one we live in. And I think there's also a reason why, um, you know, there really hasn't been that much good fiction written about the age of the cell phone because it is a nightmare to render onto. I mean, even with movies too, right? Like it's like, there's so few, like, instances of people incorporating the sort of like panoptic, overstimulated headspace that we live in into a world that people actually want to go to for any kind of like deepening or escape, right? I mean, I, I feel, um, and, and this, it's like not only do you not have like Rita Ora and your like iPhone news alerts, it's like you have, you have nothing but the, like these two houses and the rocking chair and the chain link fence, like there's something, there's something so, um, like spiritually soothing about about that aspect. Too. And the phones are for phone calls and like occasional texts. Yeah, like nobody there's sends a, a text. Text. There's like two texts in the yeah, whole book. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like kind of gags. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Is that? Yeah, not a fun sight. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> where was the bookstore that you did you? Where was the nearest bookstore? Did you where, like were you a library reader? Library. Like, that was the closest way to get books. It was yeah. a library in the town near the one I grew up in. Hondo, which I call Trevino in this. Again, I was just like trying to distance myself there. It was yeah. Hondo. And then if there was bookstores in San Antonio. It mm -hmm. was in, or Evaldi, but San Antonio. Like, we didn't go. We went to Evaldi to go to the movies. Like, not that. So, um, texted with like a Walden book, so Barnes & Noble, yeah. orders. Um, kind of like slowly evolved from just a Walden 
to Barnes and Noble, and then borders were like the hot new thing when I was in high school. It's like, want to go to the borders and like and hang out for and get a strawberries and cream at Starbucks and just like sit. I think you sir, are going to be the last question. Yeah. Um, thank you guys all. Uh, well, thank you so much for this. Um, I have two kind of quick questions. Uh, now that the book is written, I'm curious if you ever thought about turning it back into a free play and how it's going to be. Um, and if you I'm also, I'm oh, sorry. Oh no. <laughs> No, go on, go on. I, I was sort of like, is anyone? <laughs> uh, also, I'm just curious if you would have like three matches or something like that. Uh, I asked Bobby this two days ago. I do, yeah, it would be fun. Like, yes, that would be very fun. I, but the thing I like about, and the reason I never like pursued screenwriting ever seriously is because the, Writing the novel just felt like just this nice solitary thing, and I was just like, I can do it, and I can be happy if it doesn't sell. If it sells, great, amazing. And like the act of like getting a movie made makes me want to like rip my hair out, and I've never even done it. And I'm just like, I want, I kind of, it just sounds so awful. Um, but uh, I absolutely think about who would play these people. Always, always. Um, what they're listening to, what's my the score, like absolutely. But like that's totally, I try not to take any of that too seriously, but to answer your question, if the main person is extremely vivid for me, no one else really is, they kind of go back and forth, but I can answer your question in that the protagonist is an actress that some people are going to hoot and for, and other people are going to say, are going to pull out IMDb and be like, what the fuck? It's Mary Kay Place, and if you don't know who Mary Kay Place is, there we go. If you don't know who Mary Kay Place is, the best reference point I think I can have for most people is, have you seen It's Complicated? Okay. You know Meryl Streep has some friends. <laughs> Rita Wilson, not that one. The younger one who's like, get it girl, not that one. The other one who's like, I think this is a bad idea, that's Mary Kay Place. <laughs> and I think she'd be a good Mary Alice, but she might even be a little too old, because I think a lot of these actors that I think of are like, quickly aging out of this character, so I don't really know, I actually don't, I don't know, um, but I definitely thought of her, so thanks, that's a, that's a fun last question. Yeah. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you Bobby and Gia for joining us, and congratulations again to Bobby for this wonderful debut. As I mentioned earlier, um, most of the books that we picked up today were pre-signed, but if you'd like it personalized to you or your best friend who's also your neighbor, then Bobby will be signing and personalizing books at the table right next to the stage. Otherwise, we've got additional books available for purchase. And that's all from me. Thank you all so much, and let's give Bobby a deal.